<laughs> Let's face it. Liberals are offended by everything. Right on. And they have zero sense of humor. Right on. Huh? Right on. It's the party game that pokes fun at political correctness and liberalism run amok. But making fun of them is hilarious for the rest of us. So play right on and mock the progressive left and their fake news media counterparts in a variety of categories, such as race hustle, (laughs) the wussification of America, earth snobs, Islam abomination, Hollywood hypocrites, and campus coddling. Feminism. Feminism follies and rainbow games, and don't forget, millennial <laughs> entitlement and many others. Right on, created by conservatives for conservatives. Because mocking the left feels so right on. Give the gift of <laughs> all year long by going to rightongame.com. That's rightongame.com. Use promo code MOJO50 for a 10% discount. That's rightongame.com, promo code MOJO50 for 10% off. And while you're there, check out the new drinking game option. Warning, microaggressions contained in this box. Millennials and snowflakes will be offended by its contents. Retreating to safe spaces are highly recommended. Rightongame.com, promo code MOJO50 for 10% off. (laughs) Rightongame.com. the truth the denise simon experience the truth matrix vetting exposing drilling down to the truth rolling thunder this is hitman seattle hitman this is rolling thunder seattle the denise simon experience exposing politics lies demagoguery spin fraud Mike Charlie, 435-921. Great to Mark. Mike Charlie, 473-9er, 89er, out. Promoting individual situational awareness. Question, probe, notice, ask why. Mark Smoke on the deck, two rounds, AGPT, gas, TOT, 53 Simon Experience. And thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us here on the Denise Simon Experience. Um, we're going to have a little discussion here about the budget because nobody seems to have that discussion. At least uh, it kind of gets ignored somehow. So um, what did I do? I trotted on over to the, an expert, and that's Romina Bacha. Um, she is the financial fiscal economic guru expert at heritage and every year heritage puts out something known as the blueprint for balance and i find it really quite fascinating i'm hoping that somebody can (laughs) walk up and down the halls of the congress and be passing this out and say sign this sign this so romina thanks so much for the good work and being with us on the denise simon experience Thank you so much for having me, Denise, and for raising awareness to our growing national debt crisis <sighs> and that we need a budget to fix it. Yes, we do. Um, there's there's a little teeny bit of chatter about it, but nobody's taking any of it seriously. And if you look at any of these presidential candidates, uh, the kind of monies that they're talking about that would apply to their initiatives or their plans that they would, you know, initiate if they became president are really outrageous. Um, uh, Romina, is this um, blueprint for balance? Uh, I see it's in six chapters. Did I get that right? Yes, we have six chapters. There's um, four introductory chapters that explain explain the dangers from the rising national debt and talk in depth about the solutions, especially entitlement reform, that will be necessary to curb the debt over the long run. And then we have one chapter dedicated to policy priorities for the conservative movement. So that's really comprehensive and gives you just two to three paragraphs on every priority issue for the conservative movement, from infrastructure to religious freedom to education choice, it's all in there. And then chapter six is where we dig really deep into the belly of the beast and we provide about 250 proposals and policy writers 
for Congress and the administration to promote and pursue through the budget process. So that gets into the spending bills that Congress has to pass um, every year. Even if they fail to do a budget, they still have to pass those spending bills. And there's 250 proposals that lawmakers can use to cut spending, eliminate inappropriate and wasteful and duplicative programs, and return power to the people and the states. God, what a Herculean task, Romina. Um, is there any one initiative that's, uh, I don't want to say chapter, because, I mean, you kind of described that, but is there any one initiative that is more expedient than the other? I mean, it, is it, uh, if we kind of package Medicare and Medicaid, Obamacare and Social Security into one are those four items more important than say defense spending or um you know education so we have a, you can look at it in a couple of ways one is what will it really take to get control of our debt to stop the growth in the deficit which is growing uncontrollably right now and to put uh, the federal government on a sustainable fiscal path so we don't have to raise taxes on middle class and lower income workers in the near future because that's one of the big threats right now. Or you can say, what are the political opportunities? What can we actually get done with this Congress and with the priorities that the president has named? So if you're approaching it from the first perspective, yes, uh, entitlement, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the big health care programs and Social Security make up more than half of the budget, and they make up uh, more than 85% of the spending growth over the next 10 years, and then uh, fr growing from there. So that's where you need to tackle if you want to control the debt in the long run. But that doesn't mean there aren't opportunities immediately through the uh, spending bills that Congress has to pass. And just to name one area, um, the president has sh uh, sh shed a much brighter light on immigration reform and yes. on America's policies there. And the American people are very concerned, especially about welfare benefits being used uh, by immigrant households. There's one proposal in the blueprint, for example, uh, right now when a family, a household, uh, becomes eligible for food stamps and for other welfare benefits, Medicaid, etc. The, we're not counting any income from um, undocumented or illegal aliens that are living with that household. This is a proposal that says we count everyone in that household when we're when we're figuring out who's eligible, including um, if you if your household includes illegal aliens. And uh, that actually would save over four hundred million dollars in just one year. So that's a big uh, that's a big deal, and that's something we think that might be politically interesting uh, for the president. So we have everything from the big reforms to small things like this um, that are more politically pertinent right now. Well, I'm glad you mentioned immigration, um, but you mentioned a piece of it. Um, the other p uh, part of immigration that we really can't apply a number to is the growing cost of uh, Border Patrol and ICE and detention and transportation and judges and all those other kinds of things because that's, that number just keeps expanding such that we can't even predict it, correct? Yes, the president has been asking Congress for more monies to deal with the humanitarian crisis at the border as well. And um, Congress has been withholding that for political reasons. But one of the ways the blueprint can be helpful to the administration is that there are, there are many areas where we can cut, where we can reprogram funds that can go towards core constitutional priorities like securing our border, like pro uh, providing for national defense here in our homeland, and also in upholding our commitments um, abroad to creating stability globally. Um, defense and homeland security are two priority areas where the blueprint redirects funding from inappropriate uh, non-defense programs, non-security programs, um, including a lot of welfare programs and slush funds, 
One of them is the Community Development Block Grant Program, which sounds really nice, community development, who could be opposed to that? But when you actually look at what it funds, it's purely local special interest projects that can be handled on a state and local level that don't require federal involvement. And it also includes subsidies to private industry, to private businesses. Uh, some of them are funny, like for example, a subsidy for a pet shampoo company is among those grants. Um, I like pets, sometimes they need a shampoo, but that doesn't mean that we need to finance that on the backs of the next generation when we have a trillion dollar deficit. So there are lots of areas where we can reprogram funds, move them towards high priority issues uh, without having to increase the deficit. The, the other part of the Herculean task, I think, and what I'm hearing from you, Romina, is uh, when it comes to stopping some spending or reducing some spending or controlling it, uh, you have to apply some policies to that. And the policy, I guess, has to come first in order to get to the dollar amount. Is that right? That's right. The policy drives the savings or, in this case, it drives the spending. And it, let me just give one a pertinent example because all Americans care about health care. Um, we want to make sure everyone has access to quality, affordable health care, especially those among us who need it, who are suffering from illnesses and, with, and living with disabilities. That is something we can all agree on. But we have a system now that is so convoluted, so expensive, so full of cronyism and improper payments, wasteful spending on, from the government and bad rules for how the government compensates hospitals and doctors that are driving up the cost, that there's great opportunity to provide uh, that better quality health care at lower cost by having more competition and transparency in the health care market. So, for example, with Medicare, moving towards a premium support system that brings more private sector market forces into health care. Um, that would actually reduce costs, including for seniors who are on the Medicare program because they pay uh, a large portion of their health care through premiums that they have to pay. If we can bring down the cost of the program, it will save seniors money on their premiums. It will also save taxpayers money. So there's all this low hanging fruit, but we need leadership from the Congress and leadership from the president to actually fix some of these issues. They don't have to be tough political battles. Um, it's when politics is in the way of good policy, we end up with all this bad spending and we end up with systems that fail to meet the needs of the American people. Ooh. Romina, is there one agency that is probably more egregious in, in waste, fraud and abuse than another? Well, if you're looking at total dollar amounts, um, if, uh, in improper payments, they are reported every year because there's a lot that happens under the surface, uh, including fraud and a misallocation of money that uh, we don't know about. But just looking at what gets reported on, your, on an annual basis, because healthcare is such a big driver of spending, that's where the biggest dollar amounts of waste happen and improper payments happen. But um, if you're looking at other criteria, for example, m uh, money that goes towards things that the federal government shouldn't be in the business uh, of doing to begin with, there you look at uh, agencies like energy, EPA, a, a, a lot of these issues can be handled in the private sector and on a state and local level. Environmental protection is much better handled on a state and local level, especially when it comes to waters of the United States and yeah. other local concerns. But then also Department of Commerce. I mean, that is my favorite. The Department <laughs> of Commerce. Commerce is fundamentally a private sector initiative. Commerce, commercial. That's what we do. We exchange goods and services. We engage with businesses. The Department of Commerce primarily exists. They do some data collection, which is helpful, but we can move that to another entity. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of what they do is give out subsidies to businesses, to corporations. Um, they also uh, finance 
training and consulting services for private businesses. Uh, this is what we need. A, a government consultant telling American businessmen how to run their operations. It just doesn't make any sense. So I think that's maybe one of the most egregious ones because why is the federal government involved in commerce at all? Uh, I'm very happy to hear you say that. Um, and what about these organizations like the Export Import Bank or uh, USAID? I mean, some of these NGO, um, the Millennium Challenge. Uh, um, has has Heritage looked at all of those kinds of things? Yes, we have a, a, a chapter dedicated to the State Department, which addresses foreign aid, including USAID and the Millennium Challenge. My colleague Brett Schaefer is our expert on these issues, and uh, we have major cuts there. I mean, th those departments grew over 30 percent under the Obama administration, and one of the claims was that we were going to use more soft power, more <laughs> a diplomacy via subsidies and uh, providing foreign aid to countries uh, versus using, you know, and, and Obama actually cut uh, our defense cut the armed forces, which is why the president has spent so much time and money rebuilding the U.S. military. So, yes, there are certainly areas um, for cuts there. What was the other one you mentioned? Um, well, I, you know, I mentioned um, uh, USAID and the Millennium Challenge, Export-Import Bank. That's oh, the one Export that import uh, bank. I hate yes. that one. Uh, yes. Do you hate it, too? <laughs> yes, we've been trying to kill the Export-Import Bank for years, and it just won't die. Now, for a long time, we were reasonably successful because they didn't have enough members on their board to have a, a quorum. They weren't able to give out some of the big loans that they like to give out to Boeing and other major corporations. But the Senate just staffed that last member. Uh -huh. um, and now they can they can start doling out those big loans again. And they shouldn't exist in the first place. And that was something that McConnell made happen. He is the majority leader in the Senate. Um, he made that happen. So it's very unfortunate, but it's oftentimes the Republicans that, that yeah. make bad choices that undermine conservative policy goals, and, and that was one of it. Reviving the Export-Import Bank, it's inexcusable. We don't need it. We can't afford it. <laughs> and uh, certainly Boeing can do their own financing. I mean, it really is Boeing's bank. <laughs> I think I got your blood pressure up on that one. And and, and uh, you're joining me because as soon as every time I hear Export-Import Bank, I, my hair just kind of stands up. Uh <laughs> Now, uh, do we have the same kind of issues in some of the major cabinet uh, agencies, uh, justice or education or HUD or any of those? So education is huge because the student loan portfolio yeah. is housed in education. And that is now bigger than private credit card debt and private car loans. At $1.3 trillion, the student loan industry is the single largest, other than mortgage debt, um, a, a debt that the American people hold. And that's all managed in the de uh, Department of Education. And that is just so wrong. We are indebting these young people at such young ages in order to get a college education that we know is inflated in price. Tuition prices go up. As federal subsidies go up, all mm -hmm. that money doesn't make it more affordable for students to get an education. It does the opposite. It makes it less affordable. It, it, it does prop up uh, university administrations, and we haven't seen any correlation between that additional federal yes. money going to these schools and, and the quality education that our students are getting. In fact, quality is dropping. Yes. The administration is bloating. Um, and actual teaching is declining. Uh, we need a better system there. One of the uh, proposals we have that's also in our blueprint for balance, first of all, we need to get the federal government out of the student loan lending business. Um, private banks should be doing that, but we also need to reduce the federal subsidies that are driving up college costs so students can actually afford to get an education in America. And then we should allow 
for more innovative systems that allow investors to invest in students that have promise, that, um, that have a high likelihood of graduating, and then allow those students to uh, repay those investors based on their earnings after they graduate, rather than um, p putting such huge debt on, on many students who drop out before graduation, mm -hmm. and they're just saddled uh, with this debt. And, and we're seeing it, that means they marry later, they buy homes later, um, and all of that impacts our economy and impacts those families uh, the most. I, I, I've seen because of technology, because of internet, because of cloud computing and all these other kinds of things, really the actual cost of education, both at the university level and I would say at the public education system, has to be a lot lower. Has anybody studied that? Because, I mean, we're not buying textbooks, uh, you know, and these, these professors are subsidized by, you know, um, other entities like, you know, publishers or you know, research or, you know, drug manufacturers, you know, all those other kinds of things. So, but I mean, <laughs> has anybody really looked at that the cost has actually gone down, but we're not admitting it? Yes, because of all the subsidies, the actual price tag has gone up yes. when the actual cost should be going down. Yes. And uh, because we have these huge market distortions, another proposal we have is to um, decouple uh, federal assistance from federal accreditation. That would allow for more competition for yeah. different kinds of educational models to emerge and get accredited by private accreditors. Because right now, the accreditation system is also a government monopoly that helps to drive up costs keep other models out of the marketplace like apprenticeship and vocational training that could lead to degrees um, that could be provided by private uh, sector providers um, all of those are options that aren't on the table because of the federal involvement and control and so i mean i mean we've covered an awful lot here um you know we haven't even really spoken too much about interior or parks or you know um I, I would guess, you know, uh, food and drug and agriculture. So, I mean, I mean it, it really kind of covers the gamut here. Um, and you kind of put this all in a 10-year window, correct? Yes, we balance the budget over a period of 10 years. That's if you don't account for the additional economic growth that we would unleash if Congress adopted our blueprint for balance as the budget for the United States. With that additional economic growth, we balance in six years instead wow. of in ten. And with that, I have to leave. I'm so yeah, sorry. well, it I was going to say pleasure. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, go visit heritageblueprintforbalance.org. Thank you. This is Don Newen with Cowboy Logic Radio, and I carry my Sig Sauer 9mm every day. It's like a MasterCard. I never leave home without it. And I'm glad you do, given that you work in Atlanta every day, talking about a rough place to work. Well, Donna, I would say that most of our beloved Cowboy Logic Radio listeners not only own, but carry their weapons, too. It's just the thing to do nowadays. So do I, Don. And we need to share with our listeners a fantastic weapons company, Tar River Arms. Oh, and I should mention, they were founded by United States Marine. Enough said, right? Bad assomatic. TarRiverArms.com. That's T-A-R RiverArms.com. Tar River Arms, America's first virtual gun store, makes it easier and more comfortable than ever to purchase your firearm online. And through 3D interactive experiences, you can even view and inspect that gun you're purchasing. They even have weekly specials that eliminate shipping and broker fees, Donna. Great guns, great prices, and great service. And remember... Tar River Arms is veteran-owned and operated. Don, would you expect anything less from a Marine? No, ma'am. At TarRiverArms.com, you can search by caliber, manufacturer, and firearm types. Revolvers, semi-automatic pistols, including your SIG, Don. Short barrel rifles, long rifles, shotguns, and NFA silencers. 
They even have very hard to find products such as the H and K MP5. Totally badass. Tar River Arms have some of the coolest high end tactical weapons made, all at great prices. TarRiverArms.com, U.S. Marine owned and operated. Hoorah! Hoorah! And thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for hanging with us here on the Denise Simon Experience. I got put on a VIP list earlier in the week, and um, I I don't know that I've ever been a VIP person, but Dan Gabriel was generous enough to put me on a list, and that was to go view a premiere film that he... (laughs) Is, is I guess to highly be gra- congratulated for this film is Mosul. Um, Dan is former CIA. Um, this is a documentary film, and uh, it's something that just is really I think burning uh, a, a fire in his belly that he had to do this. Um, Dan and his career had been deployed a couple of times to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, fun places. Um, but I'm going to let Dan tell you where you can go see this film because you got to see it. Um, so with that, Mr. Dan Gabriel, welcome to the Denise Simon experience. Denise, thanks for having me. And so great to meet you this week in Tampa. Oh, uh, you are too kind. And I've never been to we that theater your, we either. We loved your question. I hope you, I hope your questions are as easy as the ones that you asked on Tuesday. Never, I never, <laughs> never. I don't do softball questions. Um, although I'd that never been to that theater, theater right? either. That theater yeah, was that pretty was a cool. tremendous theater. Um, all right. So how long did it, I mean, you've got tens of maybe hundreds of hours of film um, for uh, that were, you know, part of the final product of the film Mosul. Um, how long was this project for you? Too long. So we, <laughs> we started filming in October of 2016 uh, and filmed all the way through July of 2017. And we spent about, I guess it was about a year um, in the editing suite getting it, getting the story down, which is obviously the most important part. Um, and then throw in the post-production and the music. which The, the film has an original score. Uh, and you got a chance to hear from Fotech, our composer. <laughs> really proud of what he did. Um, and then the sound design was another uh, level. And then the whole marketing and, and rollout is really taking the last six to seven months. So yeah, it'll be three years come October. Well, the music was um, amazing. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure how, where you find those kinds of talents to do that kind of music that so fits with all of, I would say the, the characters that are in your film. Um, and what is particularly fascinating is the film included a lot of uh, tribes, if you will, a lot of cultures, um, a lot of religions, uh, I would add. Um, and that is a, a piece part that we don't hear in the media. We, we don't really realize the volume and the width of the, the backgrounds of the people in Iraq, do we? We don't. It's a, it's a very diverse society. It's, it's really a tapestry of different religions and clans and uh, uh you know um it's it's just a fabulous place i mean it's it's the birthplace of, of humanity babylon right there uh I mean, that that's iraq for you uh the sad the sad story when you know we we cover part of this although it certainly isn't the, the main uh focus of the film is is the you know basically the now non-existent uh, non-existent christian population um in that part of the world specifically iraq and you know, uh, there's a huge refugee problem both there in Syria and in, in many, many cases, the Christians have, have felt uh, the burden of that. Um, I'm going to throw you a, um, a curveball here, Mr. Dan, and that is the sykes picot Agreement. Mm-hmm. Now, this happened after World War One, and it really drew new lines, essentially, um, I would guess, eliminating all are part of the Ottoman Empire. So Iraq was born out of the Sykes-Picot. 
that was really the genesis of all of the tribes and all of the religions and all of the um, diversities and cultures and backgrounds, correct? Well, not, not necessarily the genesis of the different identities. The identities existed. What, what that agreement did is it drew lines uh, on, in the sand, really, literally. Right. And unfortunately, some of those lines didn't match up with where people lived or where people <laughs> were from. Uh, and, and different groups uh, got separated into different countries. So we have, you know, Turkey is constantly dealing with what they call the Kurdish issue. Uh, Iraq has Kurds. Uh, Iran has Kurds. So you have, in, in many ways, a, p- a people that are separated by what, what I guess they would consider would be arbitrary um, lines of, uh, that, that were imposed on them 100 years ago. So that's, that's just one part of uh, the very complicated situation that is Mosul. Well, I, I, I mentioned that, so I think if the listeners, when they understand a little bit of the history going all the way back to World War I um, with the sykes picot I, I, I think they may begin to understand the different um, characters that are part of this film. Um, right. So they can see that, you know, the, you know they, a lot of those people lived well together, right? I mean, uh, we, we can't deny that. Well, they lived well together under a dictator, right? So, you know, right. we, we saw this in, in Eastern Europe. When you have uh, that iron rule of law, um, you, you have bigger problems than what's the religion of the guy that lives next door. So, uh, yeah, and I, I think that was always the flip side of the argument of people that were, you know, not thrilled with us going into Iraq in the first place you know, back in 2002, three. Uh, so, yeah, those those types of considerations are are definitely important. Um, you know, when you're when you're looking at that part of the world, but I, I would actually I would actually go back further than than that agreement, um, and I, w- I would go back to right after the the Prophet Muhammad, uh, because th- there was a split there within the religion uh, yeah. between the, the Shia and the Sunni, and so much of the conflict that we see uh, in that part of the world, and, and specifically in Mosul. Uh, can can you really can you have to go way past Sykes Pico and, and go back to that to that split, um, and and that really is uh, the genesis of a lot of the conflict, and not just the conflict that we've seen, but conflict that we will see in the coming months and, and years, and, and we see what's you know we see that the tensions are mounting right now with Iran. Uh, yeah, they're certainly they're certainly doing that. Um, one of the takeaways that I got out of the film and I want the, the listeners to um, perhaps uh, keep in mind when they see the film is that all of these cultures, all of these religions, all of these backgrounds all came together as best as they could to help defeat and survive Islamic state. Right. So when they lived together prior to Islamic state, that was one thing. And then you know you you they they don't necessarily integrate, but then they have to integrate. But then they really did integrate and help defeat Islamic State in Iraq. Did I get that right? You did, and it's and it's really a cycle. Actually, it's a full circle. So we have the sectarianism of that region uh, leads to the creation of the Islamic State. Um, and then it's really pushing aside the sectarianism, which is really the theme of Mosul, uh, and uniting as, as uneasy allies to liberate Mosul from uh, from ISIS. And then really the, the question that goes that, that proceeds from the end of the film is, what's next? Do they stay united? Are they able to put aside these historic differences? Or does it they go right back to squabbling and, and back to the way that it was before? In doing the film, Dan, um, <laughs> Did you did you yourself end up with some anger and knowing because I mean you were an intelligence officer in the region mm-hmm. and then you know what the media says and then when you're there uh, actually interviewing all of those that are in the film did you see a a very big difference in in the real realities as opposed to what intelligence necessarily said or media or politics was saying. Sure, and I, I, I hope that's able to shine through in the film. Um, you know, I, I came from a world, obviously, being an intel officer, where you know you, you're not allowed to talk about these sorts of things, and there's uh, there's just things that we don't talk about, even though they might be great stories. Um, but but what I hope to bring uh, to the screen with Mosul 
is really just a, 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 an authenticity of understanding the culture in the region and the dynamics of the politics uh, that doesn't have anything to do with classified information or, or what I used to do back mm-hmm. in my old job. Uh, but it's really just a different way of looking at things. And I, I hope that because I don't come from Hollywood um, and my approach to putting together this story, I hope that it does turn out to be more of an authentic product uh, than, than something that would be coming out of Hollywood. Well, speaking of Hollywood, how do you go from CIA to filmmaking Hollywood? Right. Well, I'll, I mean, I'll tell you. What the I heck? Took a, <laughs> I, I did a uh, graduate program at, at NYU and you know, basically filmmaking 101. And then I did a, a producing uh, graduate course out at UCLA, and I, that taught me enough to be dangerous. And um, two years later, here we are. <laughs> so something tells me that you got some some other project in your belly, right? Well, I I think most will call for a, a sequel. You know, um, I mean, it it really does because it it, it kind of leaves you hanging in a, in a sense. I don't want to spoil the plot, but I mean the. It's not solved. The problem is not solved. It's it's just moves to the next phase now. And I, I think really a, a a documentary that looked at the bigger picture, you know, from the, the that Sunni Shia split that we talked about a minute ago, um, that looks at the proxy conflicts that are very much uh, shooting wars right now in in Yemen and Lebanon and Syria and Afghanistan, uh, and how all those problems tie back into this really this conflict between two nations, Saudi Arabia and Iran. So Iraq is really, or Mosul was really just one theater of that. And, you know, it's fascinating that, uh, you know, some things do get lost um, in all of the events that have been going on in the Middle East because Islamic State really hit humanity, the, 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 you know, the, the, the historical points. Um, you know, Mesopotamia, if you will, or Damascus, you know, they, they really hit those and then they destroyed the antiquities, correct? That's right. And we, we've got that in the film. Um, you can see what they did to the Mosul Historical Museum. It's just uh, it's just a Sad. complete erasing of history and, and uh, people's cultures. Um, it's yeah. And that's that's what the, that's what the people in Mosul are dealing with right now. How do they how do they pick up the pieces after that? And, well, that's uh, it. Build a civil society, yeah. Uh, and and I would say this Baghdad government. Uh, I mean, somebody needs to get a hold of them, um, because I mean, it, it's almost like destruction of Jerusalem or destruction of D- Damascus. I mean, how do you just destroy Mosul or how do you destroy Idlib or Aleppo? I mean, if people, you know, when you go see the film. Before you go, just kind of do a little bit of homework and, and look at some histories. I didn't learn all this in high school and college. Did you? Maybe you did. Well, maybe you learned it at the agency. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I guess I learned it between here and there. But, you know, what you learn in the textbook is different than what you learn in the field, uh, whether you're a spy or whether you're a journalist, um, you know, covering covering these these types of um, human crises. Right. And uh yeah, it is. It is different than than reading something in the textbook or just watching what you see on the news. And, and the reason that it's different is because there's people involved. Um, and that was really the great part, uh, the great experience, frankly, of, of my career at the agency, but also of making the film is just some of the really amazing people that I met all over the world um, that essentially just want the same thing as you and I do. They want to raise their families and, and live um, with a with a chance to um, to succeed in life. And that's, you know, when you really distill it down to the, the very basic core humanities, um, that's that's what it's all about. Well, uh, yeah, it's the human connection. And, and the film really um, brought that home to me, um, the human connection, because on the faces of those that were in the film, I saw two things. I saw despair. I saw fear um, with despair. But I saw determination. Um I don't think I overread that, did I? No, I, I think there's this kind of, it's it's a positive story. I mean, it's a sad story, but it's also positive because it does show uh, what can be and what could be. Um, but it's also a cautionary tale. So getting back to that despair, it's cautionary in the sense that we can't forget Mosul and, and what's happened to the city because it's literally just destroyed. And it's going to take, you know, maybe decades to rebuild and, and trillions of dollars. Uh, but it's also a it's also a lesson not to forget what happens when you have uh, the complete 
um, really decay of a civil society. Uh, when you don't have functioning government, uh, then you, you have a void where ideologies like ISIS can, can take over uh, and prey upon the, the, the fears of the people and the fears of the other uh, and, and just do commit just absolute barbaric atrocities that and we, we do have to show some of them in the film at the, at the very beginning so people have the context. Um, so there's just a, a spoiler alert there. <laughs> How much of your CIA resume um, was applied in the piece parts and in the production um, and the direction of this film? I, I would really say it's it's more of just the approach that I took to understanding the the issues in the region and the people. Uh, it's it's not certainly any training or experience that I had. It's it's just um, you know having a different perspective and, and understanding uh, you know what's uh, understanding how to get at the heart of the matter, right? So being able to look at a story and look at Mosul and, and identify here's here's the key element of the story. It's not it's not about this. It's not about that. It's about this. And then to get, you know, essentially to, to find the people that are able to, to pull the story together. So I guess to that extent, um, yeah, it's, it's about the perspective and, and the outlook, I would say, uh, that, I, that I gained over my career at the agency. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with um, former CIA intelligence officer Dan Gabriel, who is the director and the executive producer of the film Mosul which is currently um, making its rounds across the United States and premiere um, status. Uh, where can uh, people go see the film? What's, what's the schedule? Sure. So we're, we're going to do a handful of screenings around the country. We haven't nailed down uh, which cities. Uh, it's, it, there'll be you know, one-night-only type events like we, like we did in Tampa and Charleston last night. Um, and that's just because this is an independent film. And when you see films that are out you know, in every movie theater, it's because, you know, the big studios have the money to put them out there. Um, so we'll do some targeted screenings where I really want to engage, you know, local communities uh, and get them uh, to turn out for the event. Certainly veterans and, and people that are active military, people that are interested in, in foreign policy or people that will um, we'll try to reach out when we identify those cities. More immediately, you can watch it right now on iTunes. You can watch it right now on Amazon Prime. You can buy the DVD or the Blu-ray on Amazon or in Best Buy or Walmart. So it's it's literally available pretty much everywhere. Uh, it's certainly everywhere everywhere online, including cable on demand. How much, um, Dan, did uh, media and politics really interfere with the fight on the ground? Um, uh, you know, such that it may have been shortened somewhat because of bad politics and bad media reporting. Yeah, well, a really good question. I think two different questions. I'll, I'll start with the media element first. Uh, I don't think there was that much coverage uh, of the battle. I, I mean, I don't think we really had a very good perspective, certainly as Westerners, uh, into what was going on. Um, you know, if you go back to before the, the liberation began in the fall of 2016, you know, we had some we, we had a sense that there were some, you know, propaganda videos that they had released and would see some of the, the crude barbarism uh, that, that they would portray in these little you know propaganda videos that they made. Sometimes those would make uh, headlines, although I don't think many people actually ever really saw the, the full extent of it. Um, moving into the into the operation and to liberate Mosul itself. Uh, again, I, I I don't think the the mainstream media really covered it that much. Um, I know that Darwin Damon from CNN, I think is her name. Uh, uh, you know, she had some pretty good reporting from there. Uh, but the you know the the budgets for war correspondents is uh, it's pretty it's pretty significant. And uh, you know we just don't have coverage like we had like let's say back during the you know the heyday of the Iraq War uh, when we had embedded reporters with U.S. military units uh, and there was a lot of attention being paid uh, to it. You know. Um, on the issue of politics, I would say that, of course, that's that's the key question. It's it's addressed many 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 times over in the film uh, from from the different sides, and we we cover all sides of you know we show it through the Kurdish perspective and the Sunni perspective, the Shia perspective, and even the Christian perspective. So what you'll hear is you'll hear their their thoughts on the politics and what obstacles there are or are not um, to achieving the mission, which in this case is. Uh, the liberation of Mosul, and then the peace thereafter. Um, 
how much warning uh, did the United States CIA and intelligence and Pentagon and State Department have, and how much warning did the Baghdad government have of the rise of Islamic State? Well, <laughs> it's, a t- it's a tough question. I mean, I, the, the easy the easy answer was a lot. I mean, do they read the newspaper? Yes. Type of answer. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, there was just a, a, a willingness to look away and wish the problem was going to go away. Um, and I, I think ultimately what happened with the Obama administration is that they had made a commitment to withdraw the troops. Um, and unfortunately, the facts on the ground uh, necessitated that there would be some type of American involvement, which reversed that decision. So it was a, you know, it was a, a decision that this this is what the surge was all about. This is what we were talking about mm-hmm. in 2007, 2008. You can't just walk away. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we knew. We did know, and uh, um, I, I would argue now because of some decisions in 2010 and 2011, the wake of destruction of Islamic State is just, I guess, all the, that much wider, um, and it didn't have to be. Uh, you know, this film has haunted me since I saw it, <laughs> and I guess rightly so. I, I think I want it to haunt me. Um, because, uh, I mean, it's, it's almost like, I mean, my first thought this morning getting out of bed was how long are we going to fight a war on terror mm-hmm. and how long do we, I mean, how many more cities like Mosul or Fallujah or Ramadi or Idlib or, uh, you know, Aleppo or Damascus are we going to have or Sri Lanka for, you, you, you know, or, or Nigeria or Libya? I mean, how many more? theaters of dis, you know despair and destruction are in our future well the the sad answer is there's going to be a lot more um but i think more importantly is the question that follows which is should we care and which one should we care about and and there, that's what there's really no easy answer to um yeah. and yeah, you know yeah. you talk to uh you talk to veterans that were there um you know they don't want to be there forever either uh, but they also don't want to just walk away from the sacrifice, and the, the work, and the blood that's been spilled. So, so what do you do? Uh, I mean, this is what this is what President Trump is confronting right now in Afghanistan. I mean, there's no way that you can leave Afghanistan right now and, and think that that's a victory. Um, but yet, that may be the best option. I, I'm, I'm not stating that it is, but it may be. Um, you know, you're. It's uh, there, there's no end in sight. So at what point you say, you know, we're going to recognize that this problem is not fixed and we're going to leave it to somebody else to deal with, whether it's the local partners in the region, Iran and Russia, because they border Afghanistan or or what? Um, so there's I think there's a there's there was an assumption after 9-11 that, you know, you can't have you know sort of these lawless regions like like we saw with the Taliban in Afghanistan um, and that we have to take a, you know, he, Bush had kind of reversed his non-nation building uh, policies that he had run on and did a 180 and when, when he brought us to Afghanistan said we can't allow a, a, a government or a, a regime like this uh, to be in power because it will mm-hmm. serve as the, the hot you know uh, as an incubator of terrorism but I, I think that 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 whole uh, premise is, is maybe now uh, being questioned and and it's clear that we can't be involved everywhere well uh, you know kind of getting into philosophical um <laughs> policy a little bit you know certain things did work in history i mean we got rid of the um you know the hitler regime um and you know so we were able to successfully do that um not so much when it came to korea not so much when it came to vietnam but i don't know that that we can make those comparisons to this kind of a um unflag wearing enemy mm-hmm. right well that's a, another great question and uh, one of the main characters in the story captain Allah, um exact uh, it draws the exact same conclusion or the yes. exact same parallel i should say and he says well look what the look the people of japan did after world war ii you know they had a devastated nation but they they rose they from the ashes up, and rebuilt. yes i was so pleased with that 
yeah, it was it was a great analogy, and he's really the you know the intellectual warrior, if you will, um, a, a lawyer, a Shia from Basra that, that came up and, and joined the fight uh, because he believes that he has to fight for the future of his country. So the short answer is, you know, uh, Iraq and all countries need need more people like him that will uh, stand up and and um, fight for a future that's free from that type of ideology. But um, yeah, at what cost? Well, it is a cost, um, and sadly so. And I think that uh, I don't know how you could measure that cost. Uh, certainly, at the end of the film, you're you're kind of left with, and rightly so. Uh, some very hard questions that we all need to ask. And so at the end of the film, you, you had a panel. And I was very delighted to have that panel so uh, we could ask questions to to the mm -hmm. um, experts that, that you uh, had. And the one question I asked was lessons learned. Um, and I think there are some to be learned. Uh, but yet we don't, I don't know if we know all the right questions to continue to ask here at this point. Do you, Dan? Well, let's start with the, the tactical. I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of the lessons that our troops learned the hard way um, over 15 years of combat, um, insurgent tactics and, and that sort of thing, uh, we were effectively able to, to train the Iraqi security forces uh, to, to deal with that. Uh, so that I think that was a success if you're looking at a lessons learned. Um, lessons learned that may not have been paid attention to would be, you know, uh, in involving ourselves in, in foreign conflicts without really considering what is the potential end state. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this case, the people that warned about what could potentially happen in Iraq if we remove Saddam, um, and we could give you a list of the things that have happened, the Christian community being completely decimated, the rise of Iran, you know, chaos, 15 years of war, that sort of thing. Uh, but, um, you know, if, if we were to, uh, to engage in another conflict in the region, let's say, uh, hopefully people would be talking about this and, and having a frank discussion about what, what happens after the military victory, because this is constantly where we end up with a, a decisive military victory, but a questionable peace. Well, that's why I think your film is so important for um, the listeners to go see, because it, it gives us another view of really what it, you know, happened and is happening, and the consequence, the wake of destruction, and where we go from here. So, especially when we're in this whole thing now, sending you know another 10,000 10, troops over to the Middle East because of the threat of Iran and its proxies. Mm -hmm. um, so your film, it is really kind of a uh, setting the stage here. Uh, it puts a lot of things in perspective, and you know, the, the knee jerk reactions, like, let's just get out of Iraq. Let's just get out of, you know, Syria and Afghanistan, let it all. I, I think that's um, kind of a reckless knee jerk reaction personally. Um, and I think that your film kind of says some of that. Uh, I mean, cause we, we just can't let all these nations fall. I don't know if any other nations are going to step up. Right. Do one more plug on your film. Where, where are we going? Watch it today iTunes. on iTunes, absolutely, <laughs> or or Amazon, whatever uh, whatever your preference, uh, or own it on DVD and Blu-ray, also at Amazon, Walmart, or Best Buy. Excellent job, Mr. Dan Gabriel. Thanks so so much um, for being with us. Best wishes on this film. Very fun having you and meeting you, and uh, check back in often and soon. Likewise, Denise. Thank you so much. You have a uh, great week. Thank Take you. Care. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, there's more coming your way. You can't handle the truth. The Denise Simon Experience. The Truth Matrix. Vetting, exposing, drilling down to the truth. Rolling Thunder, this is Hitman, see ya. Oh. Hitman, this is Rolling Thunder, see ya now. The Denise Simon Experience. Exposing politics, lies, demagoguery, spin, fraud. Great to suppress, Mike Charlie, 435-921. Great to mark, Mike Charlie, 473-9er, 8-9er, out. 
individual situational awareness. Question. Probe. Notice. Ask why. Mark Smoke on the deck. Two rounds HEPT. Cast TOT 5 3 And now, the Denise Simon Experience. And thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for hanging with us here on the Denise Simon Experience. Yippee skippies. Um, we, we have somebody that has been uh, gracious enough to join us that's representing the whole millennial generation. And I'm so excited about this because I just, as, as an old woman, I worry that this generation is kind of lost. So um, Benjamin Backer is with us. And uh, hat tip to Benjamin Backer and all of his people. He's the president of the American um, Conservative Coalition. The American Conservative Coalition, ladies and gentlemen, make sure that you give them all the attention and support that you possibly can because we need their voices. Um, and I, I think Benji's a little upset of, at uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Um, welcome, Mr. Benji Backer, to the Denise Simon Experience. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you guys angry at Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and her nonsense? <laughs> It's so frustrating. It is, is beyond <laughs> frustrating. And uh, so, I mean, we, we're, we're actually, uh, we're called the American Conservation Coalition. We're focused on bringing uh, conservative voices back into environmental and conservation issues. And it is so frustrating to hear such a far left argument. I mean, you can actually, I'm, I'm not even going to talk about the economic side of it, which is its own animal. Uh, but I mean, the, the, the fact that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez punishes and uh, pushes on this radical agenda saying even this week that like growing cauliflower is part of colonialism. <laughs> that I mean, one was. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's hilarious. And it's just crazy because for so long, conservatives have been turned off by the environmental conversation because of people like her who have been unable to understand that that type of rhetoric just is not necessary for the environment. And her Green New Deal is terrible for the environment. You can't go to wind and solar energy overnight at any stage in this country right now. We don't have the power to do that. And that's what the um, that is what the Green New Deal proposes. And we've got to figure out a way to cut down emissions, as always. Uh, but that's not going to do it. And then you're going to end up just costing everyone money and it's not going to end up working. And, and so these radical agendas that are that are focused towards socialism take away from the important environmental conversations that we can actually have around important conservation initiatives that are going on in Florida by Republicans and nationally by Republicans that are focused on true solutions and are actually fixing environmental issues. She's not a part of that discussion right now. Not as she just discovered what a garbage disposal was. <laughs> I did see that. That uh, uh, that was yeah. <laughs> Look, I, I'm I'm not about climate change, but I am a person, and I think most of my listeners are people that certainly want to be good stewards of the environment. We don't want pollution. We want certainly clean water and clean air. And I think that that's you know a, a government needs to necessarily put out some standards, but they don't need such punishment and, and such ridiculous regulations that go to it because I, I think for the most part people are pretty good stewards of what's around them they don't want to litter and although people do um but <laughs> benji yep. i mean when you have conversations with your peers um is it fashionable to uh, subscribe to the Green New Deal because of peer pressure, or is it fashionable to to stand back and say, wait, wait, wait a second, this this uh, Green New Deal is just a little absurd? Wh which one is it? So the bolder voices, the louder voices, are the ones who are advocating for the Green New Deal. But I would say most young people aren't buying into it. And if they're buying into it, it's because it's the only policy option that's really out there. Um, you know, people don't know of, of other opportunities for uh, environmental protection. And so that's kind of what they lean and, and turn to. If they knew that there were other alternatives or they knew how bad the Green New Deal was, they wouldn't turn to it. But those are a very small minority of people. Most people are not out there advocating for the Green New Deal. They just care about the environment. They're young. They want, you know, they believe in climate change, but they want an environmental reform. They, they just they just want a better environment. 
and they don't want socialism. I would say most young people don't want socialism. I okay. go to one of the most oh, liberal cool. college campuses in the country uh, at the University of Washington, and most young people that I go to school with aren't politically active at all. They're not socialist or uh, super active in the conservative movement either. They're just kind of politically apathetic. And so as conservatives, we need to do a better job of figuring out how we can message environmental values to these people. Uh, because you're right, everyone wants to take care of the environment, but it's a matter of activating you know, our side to make sure that our voices are heard and that we're giving comprehensive policy alternatives. I would suggest um, for some of these, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, to go travel to some other countries outside the United States. And when they uh, go someplace like mainland China, um, go someplace like, uh, you know, East Africa. And you'll quickly find out that what we have here in the United States already says that we are very good stewards of our environment. Um, the United States does a remarkable job. Um, and I think that we set the standards for other countries. Um, I spent a month in China and... <laughs> For the entire time I was there in mainland China, I really felt like I was at the end of the world because of the pollution and the filth and the dirtiness. Even in Mexico, uh, you know, you know, countries in our own hemisphere. Right. Um, and so we want to preserve what we have and make that enduring. But I don't think that we need to keep punishing the United States and taxes and all of these other things be, we need to put the pressure on other countries um is that something that's considered within your generation yeah and i think one of the issues is that most people within the generation don't know about the the problems that other countries are providing <sighs> you look at you look at emissions in other countries and they're skyrocketing while well, we're staying pretty constant uh and you look at like the pollution of plastic and you know countries like China and India are contributing more to that than we are by a long shot. But I would also say, you know, despite that, and I think young people definitely need to have more of a, a knowledge base of that, it is important to realize that if you look at American history, we have led the globe in some of these amazing changes for the yes. better of society. And we have an opportunity with issues around the environment and um, pollution to continue doing that. So even though we're on the right track, and even though we are far cleaner than you know, we were when you were young and when, you know, most Americans were younger and even when I was younger, it is definitely still a place for improvement. You know, we still are emitting more emissions every single year. And no matter if you believe in climate change or not, you know that it has an effect on our health. That is no doubt. I mean, you saw it firsthand in China. So it's just important for us to first acknowledge that other countries have to deal with with these issues more so than we do, but it also provides us an opportunity as a country to take in, take the initiative and, and and lead the globe in things like this. But it doesn't have to it doesn't have to be a government mandate right. or government policy. The Paris Accords was terrible. Uh, it was a terrible piece of yes. uh, uh, of policy that actually had no net impact on the environment and didn't hold company or countries accountable that needed to be. But at the same time. We have technologies in this country that are driving down emissions. We have cleaner energies than ever before, whether that's fossil fuels cleaning up or clean energy sources that are you know, emerging into the market and becoming cheaper uh, than ever before. We have that because of the market, and we have companies transitioning to clean energy because of the market, and that is the future of environmental values. The, the government has a place in protecting our basic environmental health and keeping you know, our environment protected at a basic level. There's no doubt about that. I think most limited government conservatives would agree. Ronald Reagan agreed. But at the same time, the market can play a huge role in helping us reduce those emissions. And the, the more we innovate, the better our environment can be. And we've seen that firsthand over the past 10 years. Let me throw you a little bit of a curveball because I'm old. And I come from a generation that um, we were clever and we were resourceful and we were reusable. Um, the generations that I see today, um, Benji, are really kind of the throwaway society, the disposable yeah. society. And they don't, you know, it's like, you know, they've used it for two months and then they just say discard it and throw it away. And instead of finding some other use or selling it to somebody who has, who sees some other kind of value in it. So is that whole kind of um, attitude 
somewhat pervasive in, in the millennial generation, the throwaway disposable society? I do think so. Uh, I think, you know, we, we, we as millennial and Generation Z, uh, we've grown up in, in an era where we can pretty much have whatever we want, whenever we want, just because of technology. Amazon is, is a huge player into that. I mean, you get so many packages every single day. Yes. You think about how much cardboard and waste that is for the world. And then you think about all the products that are inside those boxes that you only use for a short amount of time and then maybe throw that away too. It definitely is more of a, uh, you, we have a, we have a growing population, but we also have people using way more products in a shorter amount of time yes. than ever before. And so I completely agree. And I think when you look at, there's actually a study done by the University of Michigan that showed that climate change uh, skeptics uh, were more eco-friendly in their day-to-day -day lives than climate change activists. Uh, and so, thank while you. I thank you yeah, for saying that. <laughs> and, and, and I actually believe in climate change and that humans have an impact. Um, but that study showed firsthand uh, that, and I believe that as a conservative, but that study showed firsthand that it's not like a parallel between uh, if you say you care about the environment in a major way and you don't, but if you look at the younger generations, they care about the environment and they care about climate change, but they don't think about their personal impact that much. Yes. And, and that, and that is definitely an issue that we have to tackle and figure out how can we get young people to think about their impact. And every time they're purchasing something, think about how is this going to affect the planet? And it doesn't even have to do with climate change. It could do with the, have to, like the, the amazing waste problems that we have and the plastic pollution and, and everything like that. How do we cut down our usage of these, of these, uh, you know, unnecessary products. And I think like, you know, one use plastics is a perfect example, but mm -hmm. so many opportunities for us to cut down our usage and young people aren't thinking about that. Well, there's the whole recycling thing too. Um, I, right. I think the recycling model has somewhat failed. Uh, here in yeah. the United States, sadly so. But here's another component, is there's an awful lot of organizations that take things that we donate and necessarily throw away, and they find another use, they package yep. the stuff up, and they send it on big, huge ships over to third world developing countries. If you've ever walked into the back of a Goodwill store, donation center, or a Salvation Army, there are these massive bales. I mean, they're the size of a three-car garage. Mm -hmm. the, the stuff is baled up, um, and it is put on ships, and we send it to countries, to, you know, poverty-stricken areas. So um, is there enough of that, and do you think that we need to necessarily revisit a recycling model in order to um, enhance conservation? I do, actually. You know, you look at... Just recently in the last year, um, you know, China decided to stop taking our recyclables and they now we're at a point in our country where we're like, okay, now what do we do with these? And in Seattle, we've got this program uh, where the recycled materials are actually recycled locally. And so you, uh, you actually are having your products recycled, but a lot of people who recycle, they aren't actually, their products aren't actually getting recycled and they're going straight to the landfill or they're being burned, which is worse yes. for the environment than going to the landfill. Recycling in general is a really good thing if we can figure it out. And there are so many ways to make recycled products and make a profit off of it and make it economical. And for a while, we were doing that in this country. We had, yes. the, we had the capabilities to do it and then China was able to do it for cheaper and so we just shipped it all over there. We have an opportunity now as a country to, 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 to realize that there's, a, there's an economy for recycling. There's a demand for recycling. People want to do it, and it's good for the environment, and there's a lot of money in it right now because every city and municipality pretty much in the country is like, I need a recycling facility. So, I mean, if any of your listeners are you know, somewhat uh, in, you know, in the investor world or have the opportunity to look at one of those opportunities. I that think that's a millennial huge. thing. I think they, I think you millennials need to be the new entrepreneurs when it comes to that kind of thing. I agree, but we've got to do it <laughs> in the country because it's, yes. it's such a, it's such an easy thing to do. We recycle and, and again, there's such an economy for it that we have an opportunity to, uh, to make an impact on it. But as a country, we've got to, we got to kind of turn back the clock, go back to where we were in the, you know, 60s and 70s, start building recycling uh, uh, plants and, 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 like, figure out how to actually recycle these products. Otherwise, it ends up uh, 
being worse for us. And it's, it is too bad that China is not taking our materials, but we don't we shouldn't have to rely on China to recycle. And that's just the truth. Well, there are other countries, but that's just the one of the bigger ones. I think um, the Philippines was yet another one that was taking some. And yeah, exactly yep. right. So let me ask you this, Benji, when when uh, you and, and your army of people um are out there, uh, you know, as the man on the street, what what kind of messages are you trying to impart here? We're trying to showcase that conservatives do care about the environment, that we want to get active, but that we need to get active. And not enough conservatives, young or old, are active in environmental discussions. We aren't active enough in the voices that we lend. We aren't active enough in pushing it on our policy leaders to um, put it as a, a, a priority. The Democrats, every single one of their presidential candidates has a climate change platform or an environmental platform. We have nobody on our side talking about it on a national scale. We have some great Congress people, we have some great governors as Republicans that are working on it. But in general, the president doesn't really talk about it. The RNC doesn't really talk about it. And we have to do a far better job of making this something that we talk about. Because if we don't talk about it, we lose votes. And we're, we get stuck with left-leaning proposals that don't do anything for the environment and, ha- you know, really harm the economy. And uh, so that's something that, you know, we're out there talking about every single day, how these policies work from a conservative and limited government perspective and why it's important for us to engage on these uh, conversations so that we can win again on the environmental issues like we used to as Republicans between the 70s and the early 2000s. Um. Should these kind of policies or these kind of um, regulations, let's put it maybe that way, or standards, should they be really done at the state and local level as opposed to the federal government, you think? Yes. Yeah, so the in general, state and local governments do a far better job uh, of managing land and cleaning up different areas and and figuring out environmental challenges than the national level. But there are some things that the local and state level just can't tackle because there are interstate, you know, issues or the, the, but they're like national things, you know, national places of importance, like national parks are a great example of something that in general throughout history, the fact that the federal government protected national parks uh, was was something that has really benefited American society. Just last year, national parks generated $40 billion in revenue for the American economy, generates hundreds of thousands of jobs. It's really great, uh, but we don't fund them. There's actually a $13 billion backlog in funding for our national parks. So at on one hand, in, in the past, the, the government has done a, a pretty good job of managing some of those basic things like national parks, but recently has kind of failed. And so it's an issue by issue basis. So like forest management, where we have all these forest fires, that is something that local and state control can do a far better job of managing so we can have less forest fires. Um, And with our national parks, we've got to figure out how to better fund them. We have an opportunity to look at those issues case by case. And I also want to make a note that national parks aren't all federal lands. National parks are the ones that you know, like Yellowstone, Yosemite, stuff like that. It's not like, you know, you hear about Nevada being 90% owned by the federal land. None of that 90% is a national park. So it's important to make that distinction when you're looking at federal lands, there's different types. And uh, so in terms of national parks, I think the federal government does a pretty good job. Um, But, you know, as limited government conservatives, we need to look at it from a case by case basis. How does this impact the environment? How can we protect the environment best? Uh, when we actually need to protect it, because there is a lot of reason to protect the environment and not just degrade it, uh, especially, you know, public areas where we can hike and fish and ski and protect it, wildlife um, and, and also hunt and, and figure out how to protect those. Who's best to protect that and how do we make sure that it's protected in the best way possible for the economic benefit and the environmental benefit? Um, and again, I think it's a case by case basis where the, the the federal government can do it sometimes, but local and state areas can do it most of the time in a much better way. I've been a member of an organization, not to give them a plug, but um, a member of an organization called Ducks Unlimited. Yes. And a lot of people think that, yes, and a lot of people think that uh, there's just about hunting and killing uh, waterfowl, which is, you know, there is some of that, but the majority of the organization is to preserve waterways and to preserve habitats for waterfowl. 
Are there enough private organizations and or corporations, I might say, um, that are uh, partners in good environmental conservation? You know what? I think that there are enough of them, but they aren't loud enough. So Correct. Ducks Unlim- exactly. So Ducks Unlimited, Trout Unlimited, Safari Club International, uh, even some of the moderately left-leaning groups like the Nature Conservancy and Audubon, these conservation-minded groups, whether they're right-leaning, left-leaning, hunting-leaning, whatever they are, need to have a larger voice because those are the people who know how to take care of the land firsthand. They're the ones who know uh, how important it is because it's part of their livelihood, whether it's like a hobby where like for you, it's, you know, part of your identity to be, uh, you know, somebody who's outdoors and part of Ducks Unlimited, or it's just part of someone's passion and caring about the outdoors. It's something that you and, and I and others have lived through and we understand how important it is rather than some environmentalist in the middle of New York City telling us what to do. And you look at where environmentalists live, it's in big cities. And you look where conservationists, conservatives live, it's in the rural areas yes. that are parts of these groups. But yes. we have to stand up and be louder because we actually have an opportunity to, to to lend our voice because we have that firsthand experience. And and we know exactly how to take care of it because we have that experience. Well, uh, you know, Benji, what you have described and you and I have talked about here is is a lot of very... Uh, proactive activity that has been happening there that um, are really on a, almost a volunteer basis uh, where right. these people care about the environment. Um, and, and certainly when it comes to species that may be threatened for, you know, their existence, I mean, there's a lot of those too, left-leaning or right-leaning. But Mm-hmm. I can't think of a lot of other countries, even if European countries, which are obviously developed countries, um, are not doing nearly what the United States is. So why keep punishing ourselves with, you know, this Green New Deal kind of thing, right? Right, exactly. We we should not be punishing ourselves. We should be incentivizing uh, better approaches and better technologies and better conservation practices and not punishing because we are moving in the right direction. It's important to acknowledge that. It's also important to acknowledge that we have work to do still and that we haven't just like become the environmental beacon of the world. Um, And it's important to understand both of those things. But at the end of the day, punishments around the environment don't work. People always find ways around it and it ends up being worse for the environment. So we should need to stop punishing ourselves and think about the future. How do we get to that goal of a clean future with protected areas and uh, protected wildlife and good conservation? How do we get there without punishing people? Well, it's through incentives. It's through innovation. It's through technology. It's through corporate leadership. Volunteerism, yeah. Exactly. It's through personal responsibility and individual action. It's It's through local governments, state governments, and federal governments working together. And it's through bipartisanship. That is what is going to drive the future of the environmental community. We have a chance to do that, and conservatives can make that part of our message. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been speaking with uh, Benjamin Backer, who is the president of the American Conservation Coalition. You can find them at acc.eco. Um Benji, it's been a real pleasure having you. Uh, just so thrilled that y- you know you and your your army of of people and volunteers and supporters have you know taken on a, I would guess a rational <laughs> part of the argument here and are trying to spread it. So congratulations, and certainly thanks for um, your contributions. You're obviously welcome to come back. And ladies and gentlemen, there's more coming your way. So stay with us. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for hanging with us here on the Denise Simon Experience. Uh, Socialism and Snowball. Put that in the same search um, section of your internet. And you're going to come up with an article that Tim Snowball wrote over at the Hill. And he wants to get more shares on it. 
and he needs more shares on it because so we can't get socialism to go away. So we're going to talk to Tim Snowball um, on why socialism needs to go away and what the good arguments are because he kind of lays it out. So um, Tim Snowball is our Esquire du jour from the Pacific Legal Foundation and has agreed to be with us on the Denise Simon Experience. Welcome, Mr. Tim. Denise, it is an absolute <laughs> honor and a pleasure. I, I always look forward to being able to spend time with you and your audience. So I'm here. Socialism and snowball. Yeah, that means I guess my my career is either on the right right track or the wrong track. We'll decide <laughs> here shortly. All right. Let me ask you. Uh, we we have the term socialism, then we have the term democrat socialism. But let me let me kind of change some things up here. What is or is there a difference between socialism and a tyrannical government? <laughs> Uh, yeah, what well, you mean? Well, socialism and democratic socialism. With socialism, they just uh, come to your house with guns and take your stuff away and redistribute it. And in democratic socialism, you vote for gets to, who gets to hold the guns. So it's 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 pretty exciting. No, I mean, yeah, you look at these Bernie Sanders and Alexandria, <laughs> you know, Ocasio Cortez and everything. And I mean, this rhetoric. On the one hand, you go, well, they're, they're obviously they're tapping into something, right? There wouldn't be, they wouldn't have these electoral victories if there wasn't something that they were tapping into. But on the other hand, you know, I, I go out to a lot of college campuses and I speak to a lot of students and everything. And the way that they're, they, they're describing socialism, they're using this word, and it's like they don't even know what the word means. And they're just like, it's like a catchphrase or something on, on social media, hashtag socialism. And I think that's part of the problem for, because for people like you and I who are, you know, in our careers trying to combat this, this bad philosophy and, and try to restore, you know, the American Republic, if, if your opponent or the other side won't even define the term that's, that's their kind of the base of their philosophy, well, then how do you go about arguing against them? Um, have we identified some kind of... Uh... I guess high school level textbook that is out there that these teachers are using or that the professors are using at the university level. Um, of course, I don't know if anybody's using textbooks anymore because everything's internet based, but I mean, is there some kind of Howard Zinn version of a textbook that, that there, um, these I mean, teachers I mean, and professors yeah. are using for socialism? I mean, I'm sure there is. Like, I remember when I was uh, I was a community college student and I was transferring into UC Berkeley, and I had a friend say, uh, "Oh man, you're gonna get up there. They're gonna have you, you know, reading Karl Marx and all that." And I'm going like, "Ah, come on! It's the classes I registered for. They're not even political philosophy. They have nothing to do with Karl Marx." Well, lo and behold, of course, the first week I'm there, I'm I'm sitting reading this Marx Engels reader or whatever for this <laughs> class. I don't even know how they worked it in there. Apparently, Marx has something to say about everything, but. No, I mean, I, I'm not sure there's a specific textbook. I remember, you know, reading Marx as a uh, college student and before, and I, I always, I always stress that to people as well, is that, you know, it's one thing to, to disagree with a set of ideas or group, but you really didn't need to know their, their arguments just as well as they do, if not better, to really have a good idea of, of being able to, to refute them, right? So I, I read Marx, and like, don't get me wrong, I mean, Karl Marx is a fantastic fiction writer, right? I feel, I feel like you should be able to go into like Barnes right. and Noble and Karl Marx should be like right there along with like C.S. Lewis and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe or something, right? Because nothing that Karl Marx said would come to pass has come to pass, right? He wasn't a great historian. He wasn't a great economist. He wasn't a great, uh, you know, soothsayer, right? All these things he said were, were going to happen. The proletariat classes would rise up and seize the means of production and then there would, would be this utopia, right? None of that has come to pass. Every time you've seen socialism or communism actually be implemented, it's always at the barrel of a gun. And it's always from some ruling class coming in and using force against their own citizens to, to enforce this ideology. And so, you know, when you look at this, this is one of the points I make uh, in the article, Socialism Snowball, Socialism Snowball, Socialism Snowball, in Google, <laughs> is that you, you, know, you look at the historical record, and the historical record is absolutely crystal clear. Every time they've tried these systems, it's ended in the suffering and death of millions and millions of people. 
And so socialism is not a new philosophy, no matter how much the young millennial politicians want to prepackage it as some new approach, right? The new approach, historically speaking, is the basis for our republic here, individual rights, limited government, uh, the rule of law. That's new, and that, that's still quite revolutionary, um, unfortunately, right? And so there's nothing new about socialism. Um, you'll also hear them, people pivot to this argument that, oh, well, hey, you know, like socialism's working just fine in Europe. Look at Denmark. Look at Scandinavia. Those countries are, are pure socialist countries, and they're working out just fine. And, of course, it's always funny because the politicians and the members of parliament there will then have to come out and say, hey, whoa, 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 <laughs> like, we're, we're not socialist here. We have market economies, right? And so the very examples they're pointing to aren't actually good examples of what they're talking about. And they look, look no farther than Venezuela, right? I mean, if you, can, if you can sit in real time and watch the absolute implosion of a planned socialist economy and then sit there and still have like your Bernie stickers and stuff, then I don't know how if there's hope. Yeah. Say. Yeah. Is there is there help you know, you're not your 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 ideology is not amenable to evidence. It's beyond evidence. And if you're beyond evidence then you've taken on the the, the role of kind of I don't know, it, it takes on like a religious aspect. And Socialism so uh, tell, tell me uh, Socialism kind of takes away your choices or limits your choices. Um, I mean, you have to choose between A, B, or C. That's all you get. Or if you choose not to make a decision, then the government makes it for you. And so let me throw out two things, and, and I want you to blow up my argument here. Um, when it comes <laughs> to, like, <laughs> when it comes to common core, education okay. common core reduces the menu of classes that you are allowed to take so they've taken out uh, you know art they've taken out physical education and now we're we're down to they take out music and you know, all the other, and now we're down to and even history we're down to language arts whatever that is we're down to math and uh science and that's really about it so you have to fit yourself into one of those the second part of that is let's throw in the abortion debate because we keep hearing that, you know, women's rights is the ability to choose their reproductive, reproductive rights. But mm -hmm. <laughs> so they're encouraging a choice, but yet socialism is not a choice. So blow mm -hmm. up my argument. Well, I'll see, I, I think a lot of what you're talking about comes down to this idea of, of sovereignty, right? And so with our republic, the way it was set up, and this was the idea was that the governments that are closest to you, right? Like say like your local town council or something or your mayor, the people who are closest to you are going to be in the best position to know the needs and concerns of the local community, right? And mm -hmm. so it's those local governments originally that would have the most in direct influence upon individuals. And as you step out from that, say then to the county level, then we go to the state, and then from the state out to the federal government, that there would be decreasing authority to yes. police, you know, say, yeah, health and morals, right? They, they call this uh, ability, this local state ability or local ability, the, the police power, right? <laughs> Excuse me. And originally there was no police power at the level of the federal government. The federal government, Congress has these, this discrete list of things it's supposed to be able to do of these enumerated powers, and that's it. Anything outside of that, the founders thought, that they're not going to be able to do. This is the limitation of their power. All they can exercise is what's in this specific list. Of course, as we know, it hasn't worked out that way. But when it comes to education or any other uh, policy choice, right, people at the local level, it's not like a, a cookie-cutter, one-size-fits-all policy. It's going to be the best thing for any given individual. I mean, how do we know that the educational requirements of children in California are the same as the educational requirements of children in Michigan, or that children in Florida should have the same kind of uh, approach to you know reading, writing, and math as someone in Mississippi or Delaware or all these different states. Why or that every the, the sixth federal, grader is the same across the United States. Yeah, the federal government steps in with these uh, standards, these nationalized standards, 
and it's a one size fits all for the entire country and it's really it's really quite quite unfortunate and i mean it, there there is as you as you point out there is a certain um you know contradiction there i mean look at <laughs> excuse me again some of plf's practice like here like so we have a practice group uh, for economic liberty, right? So our entire economic liberty practice group is designed around the idea that individuals in the marketplace should be able to make their own decisions, right? And this runs ca uh, directly counter to the idea of socialism. So whether you are an entrepreneur who wants to go out and start a new business, you shouldn't have to jump through 15 uh, hoops to get some some pointless license that's just designed as a, as a barrier to entry for you to start your business. If you're a, someone in the marketplace who wants to buy something from one of these entrepreneurs, you should be able to buy something. They should be able to advertise that, right? And so a lot of what I really enjoy about, you know, working at PLF here is a lot of our practice areas run directly counter to many of these socialist ideas, and they really go to the heart of, uh, you know, American principles, whether it be free speech, property rights, economic liberty, our separation of powers group, even our equal protection group. We've got a case, I think I told you May last time, we've got a case right now out in Connecticut where Connecticut has said, uh, we're going to build these elite magnet schools, these high mm. schools, and mm. only 25, only 75% of the kids who go there can be black. The other 25% has to be white. And white and Asian students aren't going to the schools as they planned. And so instead of opening up all the seats, to the black students that are in the neighborhoods who are living in the neighborhoods of the schools, they're saying, no, no, we're going to send you down the street to the, you know, um, failing high school, and we're going to have 25% of the seats we're just going to hold open in case we can get, you know, students, uh, white students to come here. So it's absolutely egregious, and and it's it's interesting. You 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 talk about socialism, you talk about some of our casework at, here at PLF, and a lot of people don't know how bad it's gotten you know what i mean and so when i when i travel to uh, colleges like i said i visit with students quite a bit and i'll speak to the students and and a lot of times i'll give presentations on the, the u.s constitution or our uh, political philosophy and they'll come to me after the lecture and they'll say I i've never heard these ideas before how can i be three four years into my uh, bachelor's degree <laughs> and no class has ever talked about this. And I just look at them and I say, like, ask for a refund. You know, that's <laughs> that's the way it is. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's you know I've got friends who are, you know, who remain unnamed that are in higher education, right? And they'll say like, God, yeah, like I was on a hiring committee for our uh, economics department, and they go, we had you know applicants coming in, candidates coming in, who like, yeah, we didn't openly discriminate against them because they weren't you know, a uh, certain race or a certain gender or a certain political philosophy. We didn't overtly do that. He goes, but you should have heard the conversations back in the committee room when we were, like, trying to figure out who to make this offer to. And, you know, it's it's an interesting, uh, a really interesting thing when you, when you, in order to become a professor, you have to hide your true political philosophy, right, which is a valid, I mean, we're talking about basic conservatism, uh, that goes to the American founding ideals, you have to hide that and pretend to be a socialist in order to become a professor and then sit there and, when you're an adjunct and pretend to become a socialist. And then maybe 10 years later, if you you know be, get tenure, then maybe you can actually start talking about some of the ideas and the perspectives you think on, right? So it's no, it's no surprise to me that uh, people wind up graduating with these very kind of you know, truncated views on all our political matters. Truncated is a great word, and I would say that because people's work, if somebody, you know, works diligently and they become a, a, you know, a very successful engineer, um, under, the, under the socialist realm, um, you know, the government can say, well, we don't, I mean, great, you're educated and all this, but we don't want you to do that because we need you to be over here and we need mm -hmm. you to be a welder. Right. No, for is it from each according to his ability to each according to his need? It was the Karl the Karl Marx mm -hmm. uh, Communist Manifesto, right? And that's the disturbing thing. You'll see people go out and do these uh, these man on the street bits. They're called where they go out with a camera. Yeah, yeah I like those. And they ask people. Yeah, I've actually got one coming up here for PLF that we did about a month ago that we're going to be publishing soon. 
So you keep an eye keep an eye out for that. We went out to San Francisco to ask some questions. Oy. That, but but um, yeah, no, they'll they'll go out and they'll do this and they'll say, hey, excuse me, uh, I I want to just read you part of uh, you know Bernie Sanders uh, platform here, and you just let me know your first impression, what you think, okay? And I go 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 ahead. From each according to his ability to each according to his need. How do you feel about that? Oh, I think it's a great philosophy. That's fantastic. I fully support that. Blah 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 blah. And then they let them, you know, talk like you know idiots for a couple minutes, and then they say, "Yeah, that was actually Karl Marx's motto from the Communist Manifesto." And the people just look at him like, "Oh, well, uh, in that case, I don't like it." <laughs> you know what I mean? There's no no consistency, right? And so it's it's you know, you and I have spoken before. I'm not sure you know how you fix it. And my you know me writing articles like this or my small attempts just to get some of this information out there. You know, there's this especially this rhetoric of, of resentment against against millionaire or the rich, right? The, the rich or the millionaires, right? I mean, you know what's rich now currently in the United States based on like the numbers? Rich now is like, I don't know, a, a two-person household making like 120000 a year. I mean, mm-hmm. don't get me wrong, 120000 a year is a nice income, two-person household, nice income, right? But is that rich? <laughs> you know what I mean? What do, we, what do we mean by rich? And even when we mean rich, is that necessarily a bad thing? Like I look at, uh, you know, like a, a Bill Gates or a Mark Zuckerberg, who are just these ultra billionaires, right? And people will say, oh, you know, they're just they've got too much wealth. That's too much. We need to like confiscate some of their wealth and like spread it around, you know, spread the wealth around, right? And I go like, from my perspective, like I want, I wish there were more millionaires around, right? You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Like, I mean, whoever got a I, job from somebody that was poor. Yeah, no, I mean, and not, not only that, but I, I see a millionaire and I see somebody who either, for the most part, created a business or was an entrepreneur and, and invented some new item, some, something new on the market that's wound up improving the lives of our entire society. And that's, that's one of the real key aspects that socialists miss. Yes, is, that, is innovation, invention. Invention, innovation, when you, you know, you're creating wealth Or you nothing. do it and the government takes it. Yeah, it's not like there's there's this fallacy of like the fixed pie fallacy that like we have a fixed amount of wealth in society <clears throat> and then if I necessarily gain some wealth, I must have taken that away from somebody, somebody right? It's like a right, zero right. sum. Yeah, game. you didn't build someone, that. Someone must yeah, exactly. Someone must have lost <laughs> that, right? And the thing of it is is when you're an entrepreneur, you start a business, that wealth, this is new wealth you created from nothing. And, you know, think about Windows or Facebook or all these other innovations. You know, the freaking Model T from Henry Ford back in the early 20th century, right? Think about how much value these items and these inventions have added to society. Well, post-it notes. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean we could go on and on and on. Um, yeah, forever. However, yeah, however, you know, whatever, whatever amount these people, these entrepreneurs have been compensated – is a fraction, a small fraction, to the overall value they've added to our societies. And by the way, nobody forces you to go on Facebook. Nobody forces you to buy Windows or to buy Post-its or to buy the Model T. These are all things that are happening voluntarily through our free market economy, right? And that's what really, I think, a lot of times really grinds the gears of, of the socialists is when it comes down to it, Socialism is a, a philosophy of force. And so, so if you, uh, Tim, is it because we haven't taught econo- we we've taken economics out of out of the classroom? Is it because we've taken civics out of the classroom, or both? I think it's it, I think it's a combination. I think it's it's a failure of of basic education. I remember I took I took econ in high school, mm-hmm. and I remember it was the last class they have you take. In, in your senior year, your final semester, man, you're, you're so checked out by the time right. you're in your final right. semester of high school. You're just like, God, get me out of here. I don't care what they're putting up on the board. I'll just go through the motions. Just get me out of here. And like econ winds up being one of the most misunderstood yet important subjects uh, uh, of I- academia. You know what I mean? It well, explains. and the same can the same can be. I mean, I, I'm went through high school, middle school a long time before you did, and you know the guys went through something called shop class. You know, the first part of the semester was woodworking, and the second part was mechanical or automotive. 
the girls went through cooking and then the other part was went through homemaking and you know sewing and whatnot and all of a sudden you are either one you learn that you have some talents or you gain a skill and a talent that will always become useful just like economics Mm -hmm. So we've right. cheated. So, we've cheated generations out of changing the syllabus. Correct? No. Someone and someone, you know, uh, makes a point and goes, "God, you know, we spend all this time in high school with all these classes that wind up being just not pointless, but just like how many American history classes do we need? I mean, like, give me the basic American history class. But I want people to, I want people to understand how to balance a checkbook and how uh, health insurance works and retirement savings accounts." And all these things they don't teach you in high school. And then if you're somebody who doesn't wind up going on to college, you don't have any of these practical You, you don't have any of them. Completely misunderstood. And if, you, and if you're not from a family, if you don't have a, a parent who's able to teach these things to you, then, you know, you you never you, learn. You lose. You lose. You're on your own, right? And so I definitely think and I'm, I have a lot of faith in the American people. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm an optimistic individual. I work for an optimistic organization. Our entire mission here is really protecting the Bill of Rights at Pacific Legal Foundation and, and restoring the, the American Republic. And so I have a lot of faith in the American people, and it gives me solace that the majority of Americans still don't buy this stuff. The majority of Americans still see this socialism stuff, and they go, that's just not how the world works, right? And so I really think it's going to become a matter of, you know, kids kids in in college want to rebel against something, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, all right. And it's like it's like everything could be just peachy, and they're still going to find something to complain about, because that's what you do when you're eighteen, nineteen, twenty. It becomes trendy. You're like, oh, like you know, Edgy, we're going to go yeah. to like a yeah. yeah. I remember I remember when I was in college at Berkeley, right? I was a little older, but I still had friends who were like in their early twenties. They'll be like. Tim, do you want to come with us? We're going to go to this uh, protest at 4 p.m. And I'd like be like, oh, uh, yeah, well, I'll go check it out. What, what are you protesting? We're not really sure, but it's, you know, we're going to make some signs and stuff, and it'll be great. And I'm like, this is like a pep rally. You know what I mean? It becomes like a social event, right? And so the thing of it is, I guess, for, you know, Republicans or those on the right is to understand the way that that dynamic works, you know, when it comes to youth, Right. And to, to realize that the Democrats right now, you know, they're making a moral case against capitalism. And so and, and, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick somebody. Give me a name. Pick somebody because you're going to do a televised debate on the pros and cons of socialism. Who would you pick to, to be um, your adversarial opponent on, on this debate? Oh, I don't know. Um, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Okay. I would love. Oh, oh. Would God. that not be fun? <laughs> it would be a blast. But here's the thing. I'll give you. I'll give you an example. I can't remember the exact details, so bear with me. But I'll give you an example of how this dynamic works now, right? So I, I want to say that I can't remember which member of Congress it was. It may have been Joseph Lieberman, maybe one of the uh. real old, like lions mm -hmm. of the Senate or something, had. And I believe he may be retired now. I can't remember exactly who it was, but they, he put together this research report on the Green New Deal and said, like, look at this research report and, like, it, you know, we've taken the time to write this white paper up explaining why this Green New Deal bill will never pass. And even if it did, we shouldn't like it because it has all these, you know, bad things in it or it's going to be ineffective. It's just fluff. And the piece was this very professional, slick like policy paper, detailed, you know what I mean? And he, so he, they tweeted out <laughs> at Alexandria Cortez or whatever her name is, and they say like, yeah, you should take a look at this on, on Twitter. So it's public. So they're, they're giving her a little jab at her. Take a look at this and, you know, you'll see how, you know, actually how Washington actually works or something, right? And everybody's going like, oh, man, like that's, oof, they're going to like, yeah, finally, yeah, yeah. they're finally they're gonna get they're gonna get her. You know what I mean? Didn't work and out. She and she tweets back and she says like, "New party, who dis?" And like <laughs> hashtag some nonsense. Oh, it's got a million shares and people. Oh my god! Like she's so brave and everything. And she's all oh, she's. And nobody paid attention to the paper. No one read. No one read the report. <laughs> and it's like. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, so that's that's what you're up against. And and you know, you and I have spoken about this before. You know, I mean, the founders never envisioned this system of of pure democracy, right? Where it's it's all oh, the people, the people, the, the ultimate paradigm is the people. I mean, don't get me wrong. All political power in our country uh, comes from the people. It was originally invested in the people, and the people gave up some of their sovereign authority to to the government, right? When they when the United States was founded, that's all well and good. But the idea now that people think we should be uh, having you know legislation approved or enacted through like Twitter polls or something <laughs> I, I, is 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 outrageous, right? I don't care. You go on CNN, and there'll be something something in the news. And they'll sit with these. They'll bring in these, yeah. these people, these talking heads. I don't. I've never heard of. Them. I don't know who they are. They're experts in whatever. They bring them in, and they're discussing like poll numbers. Oh, this poll said this, and this is how many people think this, and the poll number, and all this. And I'm going like, I don't care how many people like this. Is it constitutional? Like, wait, like, why aren't you guys discussing the stuff that actually matters? I mean, matters. The, the per, the personal preference, like I said, like I'm a big fan of the American people, but we've got some of the most short attention spans. Yes. And like fickle tastes of, of any group that I know. It swings from week to week in terms of our political preferences. Or so what we when like you're watching the like. 6 o'clock news, do you yell at the TV? Uh, no, I don't, I don't watch the 6 o'clock news. I shield my face from it. When I'm walking <laughs> through the airport, every time I'll look up every once in a while, I'll catch a little glimpse of CNN. And I feel like I'm losing brain cells. So I have to look down really quick and keep walking. No, I, I, I grew up watching the network news, and uh, it's really unfortunate because I really used to enjoy watching the evening news. And because uh, you know, it was news and not opinion. Yeah, it was. Well, it was news, but even when it was opinion, it was like even you know even when it was more from like a liberal side of things. I really used to like you know Chris Matthews and Keith Olbermann. Like those guys were liberal, well, but at least they were like. We, we've come to now um, a whole social justice thing. And, uh, you know, the social justice is manufactured just to gain votes, just to gain headlines, just to gain popularity, just to gain fundraising dollars. That's all it really is. And then there's a lot of disappointment when those people didn't really show up at the polls at the end. But um, ladies and gentlemen, huge round of applause to uh, Tim Snowball. And uh, again, just do socialism snowball, and you'll come up with his uh, op-ed um, over at the Hill. And it, what is particularly fascinating on his op-ed are the comments, because now, while they're all over the place, you find people arguing with each other. So there's a whole fight within the comments section of his, of his op-ed. So mm. make sure that you visit that. And uh, Mr. Tim, thanks so much for being with us. And hat tip to uh, Pacific Legal Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, happy to have you with us. But uh, stay tuned because there's more coming your way.